I'm Lisa Nolan, Clinical Product Manager with GE Healthcare. Before we get started, I would like to thank our panelists for joining us today. I'd like to thank the organizers of PGA and GE Healthcare for the symposium. Before we introduce our panelists, I'd like to just briefly walk through our agenda for today. So we will start by opening up with a panel discussion to discuss low flow anesthesia, the benefits and challenges. We will have Kyle Herzog talk about our master trial results about end title control and its findings. Then we'll come back and have a continue with our panel discussion and talk about end title control, the impact and the future adoption in anesthesia. And then we'll have time at the end for some Q&A. So let me do a brief introduction on our panelists. So Dr. Jim Phillip, who is sitting in the, in the middle, is a professor of anesthesia at Harvard Medical School and an anesthesiologist and director of anesthesia bioengineering at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering from Cornell University and a doctor of medicine degree from the State University of New York Upstate Medical University in Syracuse. Dr. Phillip wrote Gas Man, a computer simulation workbook and textbook and a learning environment that teaches the kinetics and economics of inhaled anesthetics. The gas man simulator teaches the core competency of inhalation anesthesia kinetics. He created a nonprofit charitable organization, Medman Simulations Incorporated, to distribute and further develop gas man software and promote its educational use worldwide. To my left is Dr. David Hovord, he is a clinical assistant professor of anesthesiology, specializing in liver transplant anesthesiology at the University of Michigan. He is the director of both multi-specialty anesthesia and the equipment and supply program. He also leads the Green Anesthesia Initiative at Michigan Medicine. Dr. Hovord is passionate about using technology to help improve patient safety in anesthesia and is a member of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation Committee on Technology and the Patient Safety Committee at the University of Michigan. He gained his medical degrees from the universities of Oxford and Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And last at the end, we have Kyle Herzog. He has worked as an engineer at GE Healthcare in Madison, Wisconsin since 2008 after graduating with a, graduating with a biomedical engineering degree from UW-Madison. He has worked on the verification and validation team for his entire career with a focus on creating high quality and reliable anesthesia machines. Kyle has worked with end title control the majority of his career and was a lead engineer on the master trial that eventually led to the FDA approval of the end title control software. Our disclosures for our panelists today. And so we'll start with our pa opening panel discussion. So Dr. Phillip, I'd like to start with you. What is your definition of low flow anesthesia? Low flow anesthesia, <clears throat> we all use different terms for it, and the literature is uh, filled with choices. Most of us believe that low flow anesthesia is less than one liter a minute or maybe equal to one liter a minute. Some of us believe low flow should be considered getting closer to closed circuit anesthesia or at least down to 500 milliliters a minute in adults. Some of us go all the way to closed circuit anesthesia where we're doing it at the metabolic rate of the patient. But a half a liter a minute is probably the best place that we ought to be talking about. Dr. Hovord, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think I, I agree that um, I, I think you get the most benefit at half a liter a minute. I think if you go further than that, you just cause more problems for um, without getting much more benefit in terms of the environmental impact. Um, so yeah, I, I, for me, it's, it's what we're, we're trying to ask our providers to, to settle it is at 0.5 liters a minute. Great. Dr. Hovord, we'll actually stay with you. What are the benef benefits of low flow anesthesia? So, you know, <clears throat> there's benefits for the patient um, in terms of humidity and, and, and temp temperature of the gases. Uh, there's benefits to the environment for sure. Um, the uh, in, t in terms of the the, the impact of the, our anesthetic gases is is something I think that we're only really coming to grips with uh, recently, especially at the U University of Michigan. Anyway, 
Um, and if you're up at two liters a minute for, for hours, um, that gas is just venting out into the atmosphere. Um, and and there's, there's benefits to the hospital as well in terms of cost um, of, uh, of the purchasing of the anesthetic gases too. Great. So Dr. Phillip, how consistent is low flow used in your practice today? I find that my job is teaching my fellow anesthesiologists and nurse anesthetists in my own department to try to reduce their fresh gas flows, and it's not easy. That is, the teaching is easy, the learning is difficult. They don't seem to learn. In fact, let me take uh, it one step further, Lisa. In this room, raise your hand if your routine flow is one liter or less. That's great. So we have an educated group here who are working hard on protecting our environment. And in my own institution, some clinicians are doing it and some aren't, but we really have not consistently figured out a way to have them do it. And having end tidal control do it for us automatically seemed to me to be the right answer. Dr. Holvord, based on Dr. Phillips' answer and, and what you saw from the, the audience, why do you think the use of low flow is not more prevalent inside or outside practice today? Yeah, I, I just think it's kind of hard to do. And uh, there's always that fear that if you push someone to do something they don't really want to do and they're not comfortable to do, if they take their eye off the ball for a moment, um, you could end up in a situation where the patient's hypoxic or um, that they are, have inadequate depth of anesthesia. And I think, you know, that's the, especially the second one is really the essence of our job is keeping patients asleep. Um, and I if low flow anesthesia puts that at risk, then I think that is why it's hard to, hard to do in practice. And um, yeah, we all know that low flow anesthesia is a good thing to do, but when there's lots of other things going on, if you're doing a liver transplant, if you're doing other complex cases, if you're supervising a number of different rooms, it's, it's gonna be the first thing to go, I think. Are there any barriers to, to widespread adoption? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the barriers are that, um, it, that as, as, as Dr. Phillips said, you know, it's easy to do, but, but difficult to learn, um, and difficult to, easy to teach, but difficult to learn. I think that was... I think saying. the biggest barrier is understanding that if you want to change anesthetic depth, you've got to do something significant. Because if you're running low flow and you want your patient deeper, you could grab that vaporizer and turn it up to the top, and not much happens until you turn up the fresh gas flow. And then you've got to remember to turn down the fresh gas flow and turn down the vaporizer and do a whole bunch of little things. And the only goal I had was to get the end title to move up or down a little bit. So it's just technically not very feasible. The other barrier to it is if someone's going to give me a lunch break, I know that if my flows are lower than what they are used to using, they're going to mess up my perfectly good anesthetic. Therefore, I often go without lunch. <laughs> Great. So, Kyle, question for you. So there's a number of technologies that exist today to facilitate low flow anesthesia. Um, what are they, and can you address some of the risks? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the most common one that's out there is just gas monitoring that's embedded into most of the anesthesia systems. The ability to monitor your oxygen and your agent, both on the inspired and the expired side, so you know what's actually going on in your patient. That's pretty common in most of the anesthesia systems. Most of them also now have some kind of an oxygen uptake software feature. You may have heard of EcoFlow on the ACES system. I know Drager has one, Mindray has one as well. Most of the systems have some kind of a software feature that give you a visual indication of if you want to get to 25% oxygen, here's the level of flow you need. So it'll show you are you flowing too much or too little. That'll help to encourage low flow, but it doesn't actually change your flows for you. Like the doctors have said, you still have to encourage them to make those changes. Um, there are some prediction tools that are out there. Those are used a little bit more outside of the US. Uh, things like Navigator was one we had on GE where it'll tell you based on all the physiological inputs we're seeing, if you make this change, here's where we think you're gonna be in X minutes. Those aren't as used widely, I would say, 
And then the big one that we're going to talk about today is closed loop control software features. Um, the big one that we've been working on for a long time is end title control on the ASUS CS squared machine. That's the one where you're actually going to be allowed to set an end title agent and an end title oxygen value. And then when you get there, the digital mixer, the digital vaporizer that we have are going to automatically lower your flows. Now, like they've said, the hardest part is teaching people to remember to lower your flows. We're going to do that for you automatically with this feature, which we'll talk quite a bit more about. Great. Thank you, Kyle. So as Kyle said, end title control is new to the, the United States, but very familiar to if there's anyone in the room here who has worked outside of the United States. It's been around for, for quite a long time. Great. Um, so the one thing that is special and unique about end title control in the United States, so let me just give a brief definition. So end title control would G is GE Healthcare's closed loop an inhaled anesthesia and oxygen administration technology, which was approved in March of this year in 2022 by the FDA. What makes it unique is the approval process that we had to go through. So most of you may or may not be aware that the devices that you use today are class two medical devices. And what a class two medical device means is that companies can use either their own devices or another manufacturer's devices to be able to get, um, a, a use as a predicate to be able to obtain 510K clearance. But where end title control software is unique is that it is now a class three medical device on the ACES anesthesia system and it is called a pre-market approval or PMA. For others to come to the United States and bring this similar te technology such as end title control, they would need to undertake new clinical trials and then apply for a PMA with the FDA as well. This process is not a short process at all. So this process can take anywhere from two years or six to 10 years as we have seen with end title control. So as a part of this process, end title control, as Kyle will be talking about here shortly, we had to do a master trial to evaluate the safety and efficacy of using the use of the software. So Kyle, it's my pleasure to introduce you to um, present those results to the participants. Sure, sounds good. Okay, we're gonna talk about the master trial. Uh, I will warn everybody, Lisa said when, I, when she started, I started as an engineer in 2008. This was the first project I got assigned to in 2008. So actually getting to talk to people about it 14 years later and having it be here, um, amazing. I get a little passionate about it, so I'll try to keep it to a, a dull roar, but it's been quite a battle, like you said, to get it here. So what are we gonna talk about? The end title control feature itself, what actually is it, how does it work? We'll go into that a little bit more. Why did we have to do that trial? What were the details of the master trial? Some graphical comparisons of what does it look like for you as users when you're using the feature compared to fresh gas control, kind of the common way you use the system. What were the outcomes of the trial? What feedback did we get? And then a little bit of a summary. We'll do at the end. So end title control, that picture on the right, I think gives you a really good indication of what the feature is. So typically on your anesthesia systems, you're setting fresh gas oxygen and fresh gas agent. Really the percent that our system is gonna put out, but then it gets diluted in the breathing circuit. By the time it's an inspired value, it's a little bit less. Patient absorbs some, by the time they exhale, it's even less. So you may set 6% DES, and by the time you get to an end title value, it's 3.5%, 4%, something like that. That's the difference with end title control. What you're actually gonna set is a target end title oxygen and a target end title agent, and then our system is gonna ensure you actually get to those measured values. Because of that electronic control we have of our mixer, our gas mixer, and of our anesthetic agent vaporizer, we'll change those flows to get you there, and then when you do get there, that middle quick key you see there in blue comes into play, and we'll automatically lower your flows to that minimum flow value. That's the huge difference, I think, there from exactly what they've talked about. You don't have to remember to go lower your flows. We're gonna do that for you automatically in the most optimal way possible. That's the feature at a really high level. So the master trial, a long acronym you see at the top there. It was conducted at four institutions, so Duke, Emory, Iowa, and Loma Linda in 2017 and 2018. 
Uh, I will say my wife was pregnant with her first child when I was going to all these sites to do this, so she has her own opinions on the master trial that we won't uh, go over. But 248 patients, the goal was to have about half of them use end title control, half of them not use end title control, and see what the differences were. The primary goal, this one's kind of a mouthful, but we'll give a, we'll give a visual indication of it later. So the primary goal of the trial was to demonstrate that end title control achieves and maintains end title oxygen and end title agent in a manner that is non-inferior to conventional delivery. So what does that really mean? When you as clinicians are trying to get to a certain end title value, how close do you get to that setting when you're using end title control? And how close do you get when you're using fresh gas control? That's really the primary objective of the study, and we'll look at that quite a bit more. Lots of secondary goals that we had as well. Uh, functional and safety data, how much anesthetic agent did you use? A big part of this, like the doctor said again, is when you lower those flows automatically, you're gonna use less agent. So we wanted to see how much less. Number and frequency of user interactions, and then some information about discharge time from the operating room. So this graphic here, I'm gonna talk a lot about purple boxes probably the rest of the time. I'm referring to this graphic. This was the primary objective. In each of those purple boxes, you see a green line in the middle. That's the end title setting that the user is actually trying to get to. And what we were measuring is, what percent of the time do you stay in that purple box? How often are we keeping that end title value really close to where the user wants it to be? That was the primary objective. How much time are you in the purple box? I'll probably refer to that quite a bit later. So some actual examples from the clinical trial. This is a manual control case using desflurane, so not using end title control. The green line that you see there is the 6% end title value they were trying to get to. The yellow dots that you see at the bottom, those are the actual measured end title value they did get to. You notice the big gap between the two. Trying to get the 6%, they get to about 4.5, maybe 5%. That's kind of the problem that we're trying to solve with end title control. It's difficult to get to that end title value that you want to. Dilution in the breathing circuit, absorption from the patient, all of that. This is really a visual representation of that problem. Oxygen, almost the exact same story. Trying to get to 40% end title oxygen. You can see those blue dots at the bottom. That's the actual end title oxygen value they had. 20% even going lower than that. Now, trying to get to 40 and you're in that hypoxic range at times even when not using the end title control feature. Very different graph when you get to end title control. You can barely even see the green line that represents the target end title value they were trying to get to. So this is desflurane. Again, this is 6% end title target the user's trying to get to. And those yellow dots are the measured end title value. You'll notice it's pretty much right on top of it the entire time. Long case. It stays at exactly the level the user wanted the entire time. Late in the case, they make a couple changes. Again, real quickly, it gets there, and it stays there. This is the, the beauty of this feature. This is exactly what we hoped it would look like in the trial, and this is what it looked like. Oxygen, almost the same story. 50% end title oxygen they're trying to get to using the end title control feature. It gets there quickly, and it just stays there. Um, I think Lisa and I were joking before this that at time the feature is underwhelming to watch in practice because it does that. It gets to the setting and it just stays there. Like you don't have to take any actions to do it. That's what you're seeing here. This graph is uh, another one of the agent uh, when using end title control. The difference is those black dots that you see on here. Those black dots are when the end title control algorithm was running, what vaporizer settings was it giving? So kind of how you would have to change the vaporizer yourself. Every time that black dot moves, that's a different vaporizer setting that the algorithm was sending to the machine. So if as a manual user, you were going to operate the machine as perfectly as the algorithm did, that's a lot of setting changes you'd have to be making. Obviously, that's not feasible. Again, that's the beauty of this feature here. Okay, quick reminder, the purple boxes, again, the primary objective we were looking for in the trial. How often did the measured end title concentration stay close to the setting that the user wanted? This is what the master trial showed us. So those blue bars are the percent of the time in end title control. It was in the purple box. Those yellow bars are when you were not using end title control. You can see the difference pretty clearly there. Statistically significantly more time with end title control that you're staying right near that end title setting that you want. 
exactly what we expected to see, but really good to see it backed up by the numbers there. 98% for agent, 99 almost for oxygen, that you're staying right at your set value, closer to the 40 to 50 range when you're not using the end title control feature. Response and settling times. So the response time is once you set a target end title value, how long does it take to get there the first time? And you can see again, those blue bars are using the end title control feature, much lower, much faster that we're getting to that setting that you wanna be at for end title. The settling time is after it gets there once, it kind of oscillates a little, when is it just flattened out? When is it no longer changing at all from that end title value? Again, the blue bars are statistically significantly lower than the yellow bars, similar thing here. But it's gonna get there much quicker than when you're using conventional fresh gas control, and it's gonna stay there when you're using the end title control feature. We talked about using less agent and how much less agent will you use with the feature. I will say there's a ton of data available from rest of world on this as well, from when this feature's been used. Um, but what we did see in the trial Desfluorine, 26% less. ISO, 30% less. SIVO, only 5% less. We're gonna talk a lot more about that later on here. Um, that's related to that minimum flow setting in our software. We kept that at two liters a minute during the trial. We'll talk a lot more about that. Labeling of SIVO, you all know that world more than I do, but we'll get into the details of that. So 5% less on SIVO, we believe if you're if you're willing to enable set the flows lower, you're gonna see more savings on agent as well. Number of user interactions, I'd say this was the biggest surprise of the trial. Uh, in the rest of world data we've seen with end title control, you'll see 40, 50% less button presses that have to happen on our system. Again, because we take, we take care of getting you to that end title value and staying there, you don't have to make any flow changes, any vaporizer changes. In the trial, we did not see a reduction in the number of user interactions. I think it's because the red text you see there. Um, I was the one who analyzed a lot of the logs from this trial, and I think people had a new shiny toy and they were playing with it. That's kind of what I saw in the trial. They would set it to an end title agent of 1.2, then 1.3, then 1.2, then 1.1. I think they wanted to see what it could do. Um, there's some examples I have in there of that happening too, um, but later on there's some comments you'll see people still felt there was significantly less interaction with the machine when using this end title control feature. To give you an idea of how quick it was, that response time that you see, let's say you're trying to go from 0% to 2% SIVO, that first line, end title agent response time, you're gonna get there in about 68 seconds. So about one minute, I usually say. It's gonna be pretty quick that you're gonna get to the end title agent value you wanna be at. Oxygen, pretty similar story. Two minutes if you're going up, four minutes if you're going down. It is intentional that those times are a little bit slower than agent. The algorithm does target getting to your end title agent value first, then it targets getting to your oxygen value after that. So that's why those times are a little bit greater. Adverse events, this was one of the biggest discussion points with the FDA while going through the trial of what's the difference in the number of se severe adverse events and adverse events you see when using end title control or when not, no difference. No statistically significant difference whether they're using the feature or not, which is exactly what we're looking for. There's no, no safety implications about using the end title control feature. The survey that we did when it was done. So at the bottom there, those two are the ones worth noting, I think. About 90% of people said that end title control was easier to use or much easier to use, which again is what we expected because of the less button presses, because not having to make all those black dot changes that I showed in the last graph. But Good to see that represented too. There was a, a free text field at the end of the survey, or just what do you think of the feature? Tell us what you, what's on your mind. It was intuitive, fewer buttons to press, set it and forget it. Dr. Deere was one of the uh, clinical trial representatives from Duke. This is his favorite phrase he uses about it, that you set those target end title agent values and you don't have to change them again. You'll go a multi-hour case where you don't have to change them anymore after that. Um, as you get used to it, it feels like normal. People that did the clinical trial talked about after using it once or twice, I can't believe we didn't always have this. And then at the end of the trial when we had to take it away, they were not real thrilled with me when I went to uninstall it. So it becomes normal very quickly. And no need to adjust your vaporizer or your flows, exactly like we said. To do low flow now is challenging and you have to do a lot of setting changes. We're taking that out of the equation for you. 
So conclusions, end tidal control is safe and effective in achieving the desired end tidal agent and oxygen. You saw that with all the data that we showed from the trial. It rapidly attains the set levels. It maintains the levels the entire time. Some of those cases were long. I think Dr. Hovord has some examples of even longer cases we've done so far of how long it will maintain those set values. And 90% of people found it easy to use. Easier to use, less agent, less interaction with the machine. The trial really did back up everything that we thought about this feature going in. So, thank you. Great. Kyle, thank you for presenting the master trial results. So continuing on with our panel discussion, Dr. Phillip, we're gonna start uh, with you on this question. So based on what you heard, what does this mean to the practice of anesthesia in the United States? I think this means we've, we've entered a new era where we don't have to focus on the minor details of adjusting vaporizers and fresh gas flow to get our patient to the depth of anesthesia that we want. We're simply moving the patient to the depth of anesthesia that we believe the patient needs, and if we shortly thereafter decide that wasn't the right one, we just move it up and down. So we've changed the whole, I am a technician controlling my anesthesia machine into, I am an anesthesia care provider taking care of my patient, and I've got a machine that makes it easy for me to do that. Great, thank you. Dr. Hovord, you uh, represent one of the first users of end tidal control in the United States. Um, so how do you utilize end tidal control in your practice today? Yeah. Um I have the photo of the first entitled control machine coming out of the factory. Uh, it's on my wall in the office. Um, but yeah, when do we use it? Well, I use it every time I give an anesthetic in a, in a room that has the software on, on the machine. Um, quite simply, you induce the patient, secure the airway, uh, and then just activate the software on the machine. Now, it is quite interesting because the, the, the process that you need to, to go through, there's, there's a training requirement, uh, there's, a, there's a quiz, um, and the feedback we get from providers is that they think it's going to be quite complicated and then they actually use it and it's just as simple as turning it on and uh, turning it off at the end. Um, and I think that's what's been most surprising about the, you know, the experience for users. Um, when they first, when we, so we rolled it out in two sites. For the first up we, we, we put it into an ambulatory centre. Um, and there, you know, there was a lot of kind of trepidation. This is a new machine. This is a new technology. You know, we're going to be the first ones to use it in the U.S. You know, a lot of excitement, um, and and then that kind of fades away after a bit, and it just becomes the norm, and it's just kind of like what the machine does. Um, and I was talking to Carl. It's a bit like when you get a, a new phone. You know, you, you're excited about it for a week, and then it just becomes this thing that you're used to having. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's kind of, I, I think, the main points that we've found so far. Um, we haven't found providers not using it as well, which was interesting. I did wonder whether we have people say, hey, no, I can do it better. Um, as you all know, we have a tendency to over, overestimate our own performance in these things. Um, I think you can see from the graphs that Carl put out there, actually, the machine probably does it better. Um, and it just makes it easy for people to do the right thing. Um, and that's one of my guiding principles as the equipment director at U of M. Um, if we can just make it easy, you know, people come to work and want to do a good job, if we can make it easy for them to do that, and I think this is one part of, of that initiative. Dr. Holbert, is there ever a time when you elect not to use end tidal control? Uh, not so far. Um, there may be a, a time when I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> help uh, you know, residents ex understand how to um, how to implement low flow anesthesia without the software, maybe. Um, but I, I'm not sure the benefits of that, to be honest. Um, we know that the that the machine can do it better than we can. Um, I do think it's important that providers understand the principles behind low flow anesthesia still, and not just kind of give it all over to the machine. Great, thank you. So Kyle, you mentioned in the uh, trial results that you presented um, some of the comments from users. Can you 
give us a little bit more on what else you heard from from the providers that worked with Entitled Control during the trial and their on their workflow and and their engagement with their patients. Yeah, yeah, I think the the ninety percent number I talked about really speaks for itself more than anything. That ninety percent of people found this not as easy to use, easier to use than their current practice. A lot of comments just about especially early in the case when there's so much going on, that right when you have that airway controlled, that you hit that button, and it's gonna handle that ramp up, it's gonna get you there, and you can focus on the other 99 things you have to do during that point. A Lot of comments about that. Just, you've made this, yes, where we're gonna use less anesthetic agent, but less time I have to spend staring at that screen, and more time I can spend staring at my patient. There was a little bit of, uh, of comments about that. And then, again, I, I joke about the end of the trial, and us having to, uninstall the feature, but people really were upset. They had gotten so, so used to how great this was and the workflow and less agent that there was a bit of a disappointment when it went away, which I think is as good a feedback as you can get about anything, so. Dr. Hovard, the same question to you. What have you heard at Michigan? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I used, uh, it's interesting because I used this in, in England before I came to, to Michigan and uh, when I arrived at Michigan we had the same machines but it wasn't available and I did spend a few minutes trying to turn it on <laughs> looking through the settings <laughs> just like where is it, why haven't you got this? Um, uh, so yeah I mean I, di I did a liver transplant the other night overnight and we started at, at you know, 9 o'clock as, as we do and um, we used the low flow anesthesia all night long for 9 hours at with SIVO at, at 0.5. Um, we used hardly any SIVO at all. Uh, but more importantly than that, you know, there are times during a liver transplant and, and during lots of cases that things get overwhelming. Um, you know, lining, uh, reperfusion. Um, and it was nice just to have the knowledge that the machine was doing its thing and looking after you know, one aspect of the care that we're giving. Um, and I think that's been the main feedback we've got. It's just, it, it frees people up to, you know, think about the things that really matter in giving the best care to the patient. Fantastic. So, Dr. Phillip, so closed loop technologies, you know, are helping now to, to automate low flow. Is there still a benefit for anesthesia professionals knowing the science of low flow anesthesia and the and manual administration technique? If we want to keep the ologist in our name, the answer is absolutely yes. We want to understand how the machines are working and how they're doing what they're doing. Also, if within a department you've got a room or rooms that do not have this, then in those rooms, boy, do we have to make sure those clinicians are taught properly. Now, I wrote Gas Man many years ago, and as Lisa said, it is a nonprofit, total, free, downloadable from the internet, workbook it comes with. You can teach people it, or you can just hand it to your resident and say, do some experiment and show me you know how to do it. Now, the bad part about Gas Man is that it means we have to understand the kinetics when we're teaching it. But if we teach it with a resident, then we learn it, so it's okay. Uh, so the downside, again, is if we, if we forget these, under, the, these important information that we've, we've taught each other for so many years, it really is a step back in our practice as anesthesiologists. So Dr. Hovart, how would you tr plan to train or educate you know, either new providers to your facility or new residents to your facility um, on the end title control technology at your, at your facility? So yeah, I mean, we, we've actually just gone through this process, um, and fortunately we, we have an education expert um, who was really helpful in putting together the materials, but we, we use a mix of materials from GE. Um, there is a test that you need to, a quiz, <laughs> I called it, a short quiz. <laughs> um, Carl wrote the quiz. It's, it's, someone did text me and said it's not short, and it's not a quiz. <laughs> um, but, you know, we... Um, so I, I kind of uh, did a voiceover of, of, a, of a presentation and we just put it out on our learning platform. And, and it's gone fairly well. I think we're about 60, 70% at the moment um, uh, in, in terms of providers that have done the training. Um, the training is a lot harder than, than you need. But actually, I think there is some benefit to it in really understanding how the anesthesia machine works. Um, th there is a lot of details, a lot of revision. 
um, about how an anesthesia machine works, and it's not a bad thing, I, I don't think. Um, I kind of liken it, liken it to having to, um, you know, redo your, your board exams aged 45, which is a particular bugbear of mine that's coming my way. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, you actually get a, a lot of benefit out of some revision, um, and, and we found it a fairly straightforward process. Um, and the good news is, is actually using the software is a lot easier than, than, than the quiz. So. Um, and just to say, uh, Jim, what you were saying about um, the, the ologist in our name, I, I, I completely agree, and I think we've seen this with a lot of different technologies, you know, ultrasound for central line. I think now pretty much our, our residents, I don't know about everyone here, but they're using ultrasounds for pretty much every IV in an arterial line that they do. Um, and the dinosaur in me feels like they should do it the old-fashioned way. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to, that we recognize that technology improves care for patients, but we still have to know the underlying principles. Great. So, Dr. Phillip, how do you feel that closed-loop technology like Ontario Control impacts patient safety? Well, it's unfortunate that the FDA trials that you did didn't include lack of safety, meaning didn't get my patient to the depth that I wanted my patient to be. If that were in there, you would have won overwhelmingly. Now, I've done, as visiting professor in, in many institutions, a little survey asking people, have you had a time when your patient's depth was not what you wanted it to be? I stopped asking that question. I changed it to, have you not had that happen often? And the answer was, everyone raised their hands saying, yes, we see that all the time. I want the patient at one Mac, and I'm one and a half Mac, or two thirds of a Mac, and I look down and I say, oh my gosh. So I did one day, I did a scan of all my operating rooms uh, that were in, in operation in the afternoon, and I looked at all the graphic trends of anesthetic agent. And what I kept seeing was, it was going up and up and up and up, and then suddenly came down or it was drifting down and down and down and down and suddenly came up. It was when the clinician noticed that the patient wasn't where we wanted the patient to be. If that gets included into safety, this is incredibly safer than what we're doing today. Um, except you, because you're doing it already. <laughs> but for the rest of us, it's incredibly safer because this is not good for patients. We define where we want them to be. We ought to put them there, see how they respond, and as the good physicians that we are, then decide whether we want them deeper or lighter or what else we want to do for the cardiovascular system. That's really what we need, and we need a machine that will keep the patient at the depth that we put them at. Dr. Hovard, same question to you. How do you think that closed-loop technology helps to impact patient safety? So yeah, I think you can see um, from the slides um, that it's more precise. Uh, it allows more finesse. Um, you, know, you can say, I want 0 .8, 0 0.8 Mac today, and you, you can age adjust that, figure out what it is, and it will just do it, rather than this kind of random up and down that we see. Uh, and then furthermore, it allows you to do that at a flow, probably a quarter of what you normally have in practice if you're supervising a resident or two. Great, thank you. So Dr. Hovard, we're gonna stay with you for just a second. And you know, one of the benefits of end tidal control is the environmental impact and the use of, of less anesthetic agent. So, and, and being part of the, the green initiative at Michigan is reducing anesthetic gas emissions um, a meaningful goal for you? Yeah, so, um, you know, when we started to look at our emissions due to anesthesia, anesthetic gases, uh, we realized that we drove the equivalent of 14 million miles last year in terms of anesthetic gas emissions. Um, and so we came up with a, with a, with a program to change that. Um, and so the, pl the, the, the goal was to cut uh, CO2 equivalents by 80% over three years. Um, and it turns out it's actually quite easy to do. Um, it will depend actually institution to institution as to where you are right now, what is your gas mix. Um, at U of M we use a lot of nitrous oxide. So it turned out that just eliminating the nitrous oxide was gonna really help. Now, um, as part of that, we, we went wholesale from uh, isofluorane, nitrous oxide mix, to sevaflurane. Uh, the problem with that is that it's actually 
a fair bit more expensive. Um, so what Entitled Control allowed us to do was come up with a plan to reduce our CO2 equivalent emissions by, I think, actually 90%. Uh, and it's going to be cost neutral beca because of the low flow um, uh, impact on sevoflurane usage. Um, so it's transformative f for us. Uh, and, you know, in terms of people say, well, you know, while we're still building cold, coal-fired power stations, does it really matter? You know, I think we all need to do what is in our power to, to, to change. Um, and we all have the power to change our choice of anesthetic gas. Uh, if we can do it in a more environmentally and more sustainable way, I think we should. Uh, and this technology certainly helps us as an institution to do that. Dr. Phillips, same question to you. Absolutely. So with the, the environmental considerations, uh, is reducing anesthetic gas emissions a meaningful goal? I think from the sake of the planet, my children, and my grandchildren, it's really important. We're not doing a good job for our planet at the moment, and we're not doing it in many, many different ways. Yes, this little part is just a little part of that in our lives. And yes, we ought to be doing lots of other things. But to realize that we're throwing away 80 or 90% of the anesthetic agent that isn't even going in and out of the patient's lungs, it's just going out the scavenger system, that's not, not right. We shouldn't be doing that. Great, so Dr. Phillip, we're gonna stay with you for just a second. So do you see the adoption of this technology decreasing your facility's anesthetic agent utilization? Oh, absolutely. Utilization should go down significantly because I've been not totally inept at teaching low-flow anesthesia, and uh, Dr. Beverly Phillip, who happens to be in the room, also teaching low-flow anesthesia in our department. It still hasn't been successful in getting people to do it. Uh, years ago, um, three years ago, our clinical practice committee voted that we believe, although you'll ask this question later maybe, but I'll answer it now, <laughs> that we believe that it is totally safe to give sevoflurane in low fresh gas flow. We don't have barrel lime anymore that used to be the problem. We, we've changed all sorts of things in our practice. Only mice get problems with sevoflurane at low fresh gas flow. In human beings, we decided that you ought to be able to use as low a flow as you want as long as we have cool CO2 absorbance. So you want to get out the potassium hydroxide and the sodium hydroxide from them. And there are lots of those products. And you can see them on the floor today out there. There are companies making cool CO2 absorbance, and that's all we should be using. That'll allow us to use as low a fresh gas flow as we feel comfortable with. But our clinical practice committee officially said it was okay, so we felt comfortable. So maybe that's a nice thing to do in the institution, so any individual isn't afraid to do it, saying they might, in a case where the patient had some other clinical problem that got them into trouble, they would say, doctor, you use this agent off-label use, and the answer is no, it's within label in my institution. FDA regulates what companies can say about drugs, but physicians decide what physicians can do in medical practice. Great, thank you, Dr. Phillip. So Dr. Hovard, same question to you, but have you seen any differences? It's been a short time since you've had untitled control, but Comparatively, have you seen any differences over even the, the last several weeks that you've been using it with decreases in your anesthetic agent use? Um, yeah, we haven't got the data yet. Um, and, yeah, we've managed to create a dashboard which splits out um, flows at induction and flows during maintenance. Um, I'm not quite sure how they did that, but we've got some clever computer people. Um, so I, I'm really expecting to see, you know, big falls in, in flows uh, during the maintenance phase, and, uh, and, and I think that will have a big impact on, on our, you know, super flow and usage. W what is, what we have definitely seen is, um, you know, people using far less nitrous oxide when they switch to SIBO because they're not using ISO anymore, uh, and they're happier, seem happier to use it at low flows, um, despite the uh, package insert, which I think we're yeah. coming to next. Yes. 
Lisa, with your permission, let me add to what David has said. Uh, a little piece is you can't ask your pharmacy how you're doing because they order bottles no matter what. Therefore, that data is not really data that's very good here. So when we ask our own institution how we're doing, they don't do it, and the bottles expire, and they throw them away. We know that there's nothing wrong with this drug over time. Nothing happens to it. These are chemicals that are solid chemicals. Um, and if they're throwing them away and making it look like we are using too much, we've got to figure out a better way within our hospitals to look at the use. And if we have an anesthesia machine that tells us the milliliters of liquid used, we've got the answer there. So we, in fact, have, uh, on, uh, at least on all of our GE machines, we get I'm sorry, our GE ASIS machines, not yet within tidal control, we see how many milliliters we have used. So we really know that number, and if we can figure out a way to get that into Epic, it'll be a wonderful thing, because then everyone will know how frugal we're being. Great. So Dr. Phillip, you, you actually stole my thunder here, so a little bit. Jump it ahead. I apologize. <laughs> Jump it ahead to, to, to sevoflurane. So. I want to go back to that question because, you know, we still see you, you at your facility at Brigham, they have gone to clinical practice committee to say that it's okay to use less than um, two liters per minute for greater than two MAC hours. Your committee said, yes, use a half a liter, one liter. Do you still find... We said go as low as closed circuit All if right. you want to. Perfect. Um. <laughs> if you know how to. So do you, do you still find hesitancy, though, with some um, of your providers within Brigham that still are a little, eh, I don't know if I want to go that, that low? I think they say that because it's hard to control it at that low flow. That's the problem. You turn up the vaporizer with a flow of one liter or a half a liter, and you're not getting your patient deeper for quite a while. If you had in tidal control, you'd push the button and you'd be done. Great. So Kyle, um, you know, we've talked about, Dr. Phillip talked about some of the CO2 absorbance. Um, and I know there's a lot of concern about going to SIVO at, at those low flows is, is compound A. So what absorbance today, CO2 absorbance, you know, are, is that something still to be worried about with compound A? Yeah, I, I think Dr. Phillip covered it very well. And you can see that a floor below us when we walk around and look at all the ones that are out there. Um, but no, most of them now are now based, we have one at GE, calcium hydroxide, that is not going to produce compound A. It will not break down agent, it will not produce compound A. That had been a lot of the, what was going on at the time of the, the sevoflurane labeling. Um, no, the CO2 absorbance today, exactly like Dr. Phillips said, that's not a concern at this point. Great. Dr. Hovord, so do you have any advice for the audience here to consider when assessing the risk benefit of administering sevoflurane at low flows? Yeah, I mean, it was, a, it, it was a bit of a surprise, I think, when I came here that there was this kind of thing about sevo um, and compound A. I, it, and it's, it's very like, I don't know, it, compound A just seems to stick. It's one of those things that everybody knows about. Uh, it just sounds bad, you know, doesn't it? It sounds evil. It would be in a, you know, a movie as a, with Tom Cruise kind of <laughs> trying to track down the compound A. And um, it, it, it's like the Boeing man. And, and, and it's not actually a thing. You know, it's, 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 it's dangerous to mice or rats um, when you're using yeah, CO2 absorber with lots of potassium hydroxide in it. And um, we're anesthetizing humans. Uh, well, I, I am anyway, um, for the most part, uh, using soda lime without lots of potassium hydroxide. So uh, we, we, we haven't gone to the cl clinical practice committee, actually, but we did, I did as part of my teaching on, on entitled control. We pointed them to the APSF statement recently written by Dr. Feldman, which uh, goes through uh, sevoflurane. Um, and it's actually in fairly stark terms that we don't really see this as, as an issue anymore. And we took it even a little further by saying, if hospital purchasing has to buy a non-cool CO2 absorbent, they must tell us before it comes into the hospital so that we can change the rules. 
Some of you, when we saw, talk about soda lime, we don't mean soda lime, we mean CO2 absorbent. Mm -hmm. It used to be WR Grace soda lime. It's not, for most of us, it is a different substance. Great, thank you. So we'll take a pause here for a moment and, and open it up for any audience questions. Other questions? Right. Any comments from the audience? We got one. Thank you, Dr. Phillip. Who's the microphone person? Here, here. Um, raise, raise your hand high if, if you're hand about to. Hello, Mary Ann Fox, Royal Adelaide, Australia. Um, we've been using it with those GE machines, I think, since the new Royal Adelaide opened about five years ago. Um, it's very intuitive. It doesn't take any educa much education to actually use. And I recently did a locum in a country hospital without entitled CO2, entitled um, um, agent, and it was very difficult. So I think once you start using it, it's, it's so intuitive. And then when you haven't got it, it's like driving an, uh, a manual car after an automatic. So it's, it's, it's absolutely sensational. We have um, had no issues with it at all. And just back to the sevofluorane, there was never any flow restrictions in Australia, not that I remember, and uh, we've never had any problems. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Rowan Molnar, uh, former member of Dr Phillips' department. Um, I've been using uh, entitled CO2 almost every day for about 10 years or more in Australia and uh, I'm a big advocate of it. However, there is uh, one issue that uh, I don't believe has been addressed by the company, uh, and that is that uh, by the very nature of what it's trying to achieve, uh, a small leak uh, in the circuit is covered up by uh, increasing the gas flows. So whereas normally we look for our bag or our ventilator emptying out during surgery, uh, detecting a small leak, the end tidal CO2 system just puts the gas flows up to maximum to compensate for that leak. And uh, the first thing I find out about it is looking at the machine, which uh, the entitled CO2 takes my uh, attention from looking at the machine, which is one of the benefits you said. Uh, but then when I do look to the machine, it's running at 15 litres a minute uh, and my uh, circuit's full. Yeah, and, and I think the you're right, that's something that, that is there. There is still what flow are we using at any given moment that's shown on the screen, so it is there. There's also still the preoperative checkout that should detect those leaks beforehand. Um, you're right, you're right. And there is, there's a feature that's running at all times during the case called the leak check that is looking for that leak. And if it gives above a certain percent, there will be an alarm that will come up on the screen. But you are right, there's those small leaks that it is gonna, it's gonna overcome, which we would say is, it overcame that for you, it did that for you. But if it gets to a certain level, it will notify the user. Yep. Would the FDA allow you to lower that threshold? I'm sorry, allow you to allow us to lower that threshold? If I knew what the FDA would allow us to do, we would have had this feature a long time. No, um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. It's a really good question. It's good feedback. It's something that we can look into. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep, we've got a question over. Uh, can I ask you just a, a clinical question with respect to compound A formation? The SIVO bottles of whatever brand you buy still mention MACAR limitations, and that obviously is related to compound A formation. Since we're not forming compound A, your clinical opinion is this is a non-issue, or should we still be thinking about this? It's not an issue. Yes, I, we just don't think it's a thing. It, it's not made. It doesn't exist. I, you know... Thank you for the discussion. It is very interesting to see the legal and cultural differences. We are coming from Europe, from Germany, mm -hmm. and as the people said here from Australia, or there has never been a problem with sevoflurane, and this discussion simply does not exist. I admit it is a very nice machine you constructed and will be very comfortable and less work for us, but low flow anesthesia with sevoflurane, I worked in six different hospitals in Germany, 
and it's quite normal, everybody does. We start with two liters per minute, and then we go to 0 0.4 or 0 0.5, that's quite normal. And nobody cares about compound A, and uh, I think barium containing soda lime does not exist in Germany anymore. It's not on the market for more than 10 years. It's absolutely not on the market. And if you want to do something for the environment, uh, just don't use desflurane, which is a much bigger problem than sevoflurane. And if you use desflurane with low flow, then you got not compound A, but you got carbon monoxide. Mm. And this is not only dangerous for mice, but also for men. <laughs> yeah, we, we've removed desflurane from formerly at U of M for that reason. So I want to just uh, quickly before we, we end here um, and ask our panelists, so where do you see inhaled anesthetic uh, administration in the next five years, Dr. Holvord? So, you know, I'm not sure if it's going to be five years, but I, I, th I think that, you know, where does the future look? For me, the future of inhaled anesthetic administration is with an entitled control product. Um, and yeah, five, 10 years might be the time scale, uh, but I, I think it will be ubiquitous. Dr. Phillips? I think it will become more prominent in the US and eventually in Europe. Once people look at the data on TIVA, the wake-ups are terrible compared to inhaled anesthetic agents. If you're looking at propofol as, an, as a propofol anesthesia being good for nausea and vomiting, add one antiemetic to an inhaled anesthetic and you're down at that same low nausea and vomiting rate. Wake up from sevoflurane in Europe in the ICU if a patient were breathing it for 12 or 24 hours, you can get a patient awake in approximately seven minutes, awake enough to respond. And I don't know if any of you who in Europe have, have done that, but, but when simulating in gas man, I extended the number of hours you could simulate just so we could see if we can ever make these drugs not be good. And the answer is after an infinite length anesthetic, you will wake up within seven minutes with any of our drugs other than isoflurane and more soluble. Kyle, I'm actually going to ask you the same question from an engineering perspective. What do, what do you see? Yeah, I think um, closed loop control being put into the US, there's going to be a demand for what else can you make easier for us? How else can you use this technology to introduce features that, again, let me focus on all the other things that are going on and not some of these things I have to do on the machine? So it'll be a while. Um, as we've seen with the, the regulatory environment, it's always going to be a challenge but I think that's what we're gonna look for. How do we keep making these easier, make these machines help you even more? Great, thank you. So I I'd like to, one, oh, sorry, The Dr. one Phillip. reason the FDA will allow this and not TIVA, automated control, is that we for our entire lives have been managing end title as the thing we wanted to change and adjust. It's perfect, it's just what we've learned over 100 years-ish of anesthesia, and it's here to stay. It's really what we should have had. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanna thank our panelists again for your contribution, great insights um, on end title control and everything, and we'd like to thank our audience for your participation and, and um, attendance today. So thank you all, have a great rest of your show, and happy holidays to all of you.